So PDT has been to all over the United States, many more. I don't know why they picked those particular states and cities, but uh, uh, many more throughout uh, the United States and North America, uh, throughout Western Europe, China, India, Japan, uh, even down to Africa for our clients. And one really interesting example I'm just going to mention, it's not really a medical device per se. It's, uh, it's an award winner we did uh, for the Perkins School for the Blind based out of Massachusetts. And this is called the Perkins Brailler. And if you can, uh, oh, sorry, I meant to press the laser. If you can see this device here is the original version of the Perkins Brailler that's literally been on sale since about the end of World War II. It's heavy. It's made of steel. Honestly, I think it weighs about 10 pounds to carry that thing around. But what it does is it allows children and, and other blind students to type in Braille. Eventually, Perkins organization, which is a nonprofit, so they don't have a ton of money to throw around, uh, decided they needed to completely rethink this Brailler for the kind of markets that it's mostly used in, which are, tend to be third world nations uh, where conditions are extremely challenging. No electricity, uh, often no lighting, um, dirt, moisture, etc. So we went to these places and we met with people who were using the original Brailler and we built prototypes of what might be a new version and we tested those prototypes and we watched the students play with them and use them and tell us what they liked and didn't like about them. So here you see uh, the, these two pictures I believe were taken uh, in Africa and India uh, and you can see one of the early stage mock-ups we're using there, and this is something that, that a lot of design firms do, is they'll, they'll, they'll just carve out out of foam, solid materials, uh, quick form factor models uh, to test with that are inexpensive, quick to revise. Um, and, and learning about how these students carry this to and from their homes, the way they share it amongst themselves. Many of these schools might have one brailler for, for dozens of students, literally. And then you can kind of see a corner here. Sorry, this isn't the best slide. Uh, a piece of the final outcome, uh, which has been a world changer for these people. Uh, completely rethinking everything about it from the internal mechanisms to the external design, the way it's held, the way it's used, and the fact that it weighs probably about a quarter of what the original weighed. So when we're in the field, what do we focus on? Well, we want to look at the critical opportunities that are out there and the critical differences that we might find in these environments. So the user who's going to be using your device is, is probably first and foremost there. Language and cultural differences are another issue that are, that's often overlooked or misunderstood. Uh, the environment and context where your device is going to be used and stored. And maintenance, which is almost always overlooked and, and shouldn't be. So to give you a few examples, of getting to know your user. Um, in North America, uh, we've done a lot of work with infusion pumps and infusion sets, for example. And what we found is that in the United States, nurses are basically given a ready-to-go kit to hook the patient up to the pump. It takes a couple of minutes. They really don't have to assemble anything. Uh, but in Canada, it's actually a little bit different because the health system there is structured in a way where labor costs are sort of hidden. The nurses there handle a lot more of the setup and preparation of hooking the patient up. In America, we want to reduce the amount of time a nurse has to do that kind of a thing. But when we went to China for our client. We found that nurses really don't do anything. The client's expectation was, wow, these nurses aren't going to be as well trained as what we have in, you know, in our Western markets. But it turned out that that didn't even matter because in China, only the doctor is allowed to take care of the setup and hook up to the patient. So what we actually, when the, the client actually came in to the research expecting that their user was going to be a less sophisticated user, they actually came out knowing that this, their client is a far more sophisticated user and that they might be surgeons or, or, or extremely you know, highly educated physicians. In terms of language and cultural differences, I often find this to be a, a humorous slide. Um, diarrhea clinic. Well, what do you think that is? It's actually a fairly advanced gastrointestinal uh, clinic in China. I'm sure they handle more than just diarrhea. And what we find when we go to other countries like China and Japan is that most of the population doesn't speak English. 
So in the medical device community, there's a lot of talk about trying to come up with ways to communicate with non-English speakers uh, using icons, for example, that can be considered universal. And that's often a real challenge. What we found is, though, that even though a lot of the population and the users of these devices, nurses and physicians, don't speak English, they can recognize words. And oftentimes, a word on a device, a label in, in text rather than graphics, can be much safer and more accurately and quickly deciphered by the users than a pure graphic might. Or sometimes a combination of the two is the right way to go. But in India, where we expected to face similar challenges, we realized that the target market for the client's instrument was going to be primarily major cities. And although there are over 200 dialects spoken throughout the nation, in major cities, English is extremely common. So that having the documentation, having their instruction booklets, having their labels on the device in English was absolutely fine. That's something we wouldn't have known until we got there. The environment is something that never ceases to amaze us when we get off a plane. You know, in the United States, we're used to very, very sterile clinical environments where, where your devices are going to be located. But when you go to a country like India or Africa, you won't be surprised to see these devices sitting on an open windowsill, collecting dust, dirt, moisture, you name it. And would we have known that if we just interviewed people over the phone or talked to them via email or Skype? Absolutely not, because to people who work in these environments, they, don't, they just take this for granted. It's second nature to see this. But as soon as we walk into the room, it jumps out at you as a glaring challenge that you, you need to face as a medical device manufacturer. You need to design your device to withstand the kind of conditions that it's going to be used in. And sometimes you might be surprised in the opposite direction. Over on the left side of the picture here, we found a pole mounted to the floor permanently. It's not on wheels. It's about three feet or less from the wall, and there are devices on both sides, including on the wall side. Well, what if you're a nurse and an alarm goes off and you've got to attend to one of these devices? Your access is extremely limited. Well, this happens to be in a very modern facility in, that, in the United Kingdom. Here, we went to Eastern Europe and we saw a spaghetti knot of lines in a very complex blood therapy going on in a neonatal ICU. Well, we didn't expect to even see such a complex therapy going on in this environment, but what we also saw was that for every nurse, she might have had three to five child patients to monitor with equipment like this. Well, clearly, this doesn't seem like a very user-friendly environment, particularly when lives are on the line. So how do you design for these kind of challenges which are located in a developing nation, but are really very first world treatments. Maintenance is something that people often overlook. The desire is get a great device out the door and, well, hopefully it'll never break. Well, we all know that just doesn't happen. Well, maintenance in these countries is a very different situation than what you face over here. Um, for example, a lot of times people just don't even bother to read the manufacturer's directions for servicing. Um, we saw people cleaning instruments and devices with things you wouldn't want to know about. And what that does is severely limit the life cycle and potentially uh, impede performance. So when you've seen this, you need to design for it. The objective is to understand it, know that the, the, uh, the behavior is taking place, and then integrate that knowledge into the design process for the device. And when a device finally does go down, downtime is something which here is often handled by simply popping a new one on the pole. But in these countries, they really don't have money for backups in many cases. And the support network that you develop along with your sales support in these countries is absolutely critical because you can't afford to let your machines turn into this. They're not going to buy from you again if you haven't handled the maintenance side of the equation. A few overall trends that we've also learned when we're, when we're going overseas. You know, in China and countries where healthcare is based on a patient's ability to pay, consumables are actually a profit center. 
so that having a device which goes through consumables is something that your purchasing people over there are actually going to appreciate. But in a country like Japan, which is extraordinarily advanced in, in terms of their healthcare system, it's a socialized system and the consumables are rationed and nobody gets better treatment because they can pay more. So for that market, you actually want to design a device where consumables are absolutely minimized or perhaps even taken out of the equation. So you need to understand the healthcare system itself. And the people who are going to interact with your equipment vary from nation to nation. Um, when you're overseas in some of these markets, you wouldn't believe the untrained technical people who are called in to fix things. Or the types of relationships that a sale depends on. Uh, for example, um, I wouldn't say the word bribe, and we would never encourage a client to, to do something like that, of course. Uh, but building relationships overseas of this nature is something that a lot of times you're just not prepared for. And it needs to be built into your business model, just like the features on your device. Clients are often shocked to see that the useful lives of the device are extended two and three times their intended useful life. Well, what do you do with that in your development plans? You need to design for it. One thing that we found, though, just in closing, that kind of unifies what we've done here for clients in the US as well as for them overseas is that every nurse and physician's goal at the end of the day is to spend as much time with their patient as they can and to focus on that patient's needs. But increasingly, the paperwork and the documentation take up more and more time. So one thing that everyone wants are devices that minimize that type of work and allow them to focus on where, they, where, they, where, they, where their care is, is most needed. But the way that's executed could be very different in different environments. So here in the US, for example, a more complicated machine that handles a variety of tasks and documentation and has a more complex interface to work, uh, interface to work with, excuse me, uh, might be called for. But overseas, absolutely simplifying the way it works and defeaturing to its core necess necessary uh, functionality might be the solution. Same goal, different solutions. So that's really what I wanted to mention today, uh, you've got a lot of opportunity out there, but don't take it for granted. Don't just try to get by with what you're already doing. Spend a little time, invest a bit of money to get over there, understand where those opportunities really lie and what makes them different from the opportunities here, and it will significantly increase your chances of success when you try to go over there. That's about it. Thank you.